Okay, so let's give it a go. Welcome everyone to the Buying a Home in Rotterdam webinar. Um, my name is Kimo. I am the founder of Expert Housing Network. I am half Dutch, half Caribbean. I have a daughter who's four, but thinks she's 16, so that's always fun. And I bought my own home about five years ago. Um, but um, yeah, back then I wasn't in the business of helping people find a home to buy yet. So what did I know, right? If I would have known then what I know now, things would have looked a little bit different because it took me seven offers before I got a final offer accepted. Um, it was already quite competitive back then. But again, if I would have known then what I know now, things would have looked a little bit different. Nevertheless, I'm happy with the house I bought in the end and I have, I'm happy that I bought it that time. Um, today, we're going to talk about a few things. Introduction to EHN. We're going to talk about the mindset of getting into the market. Also about savings. What do you need to actually start the process? And I'm going to share some tips to win in the current market. Then we'll talk about timeline and there'll be time for the Q&A. Um, maybe give a, a small test. Can everybody hear me all right? Um, if you have any questions, please pop them in the chat. Don't pop them in the Q&A because with my screen share, I won't be able to see the Q&A. I will be able to see the chat. So if you have any questions along the way, then please feel free to pop them in there. Um, cool, let's give it a go. So um, a little introduction. Um, I believe greatness is achieved in the agency of others. What does that mean? That if you decide to move forward with our service, you'll probably be working with one of the team members. Um, the uh, team members are all either from abroad or have lived abroad. So they know what it's like to move to a new country and set up a new home. They've also helped plenty of people now with purchasing their home and they've got plenty of experience and knowledge. So we're here to help you support uh, or well, we're here to help you or help support you with securing your new home if you would like to. Um, we're not traditional real estate, so we don't have a background in real estate. We have a background in the liberal arts, psychology, name it. Uh, we do have plenty of experience by now. And what, what we do is we focus on helping you buy a home. We don't do sell properties. And why is that important? Because if you go to a realtor that does selling and buying, most likely he'll gravitate towards the selling part because right now it's a seller's market. So it's much easier to sell a property than to buy a property. We also charge a fixed fee, so no commission, and we know what it's like to sell in a new country. Um, what's the added value of EHN? Well, what we do is we make, of course, the offers, and agents often take our offers more seriously because they know there's a party behind you that has done due diligence, so you're serious. Also, we can sometimes book in viewings when it's no longer possible, and we support, of course, by reviewing legal documents. We help define the market value, very important. I'll talk a little bit more about that in later, and we'll inform you about rules and regulations. And of course, the last thing, we want to make sure that you don't make the same mistakes that I made five years ago. Okay, now I have a question for you guys. Where in the process are you? Are you in your orientation stage? Maybe are you already searching or viewing properties? Have you submitted an offer? And maybe if you actually have an offer accepted, please feel free to pop it in the chat, and then I know where you guys are. Um, we don't have to wait up for the answers, um, but I see some people in orientation. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the actual mind state. Why is that important? Well, um, currently the market is hot and maybe you've heard or read in the news about price going up, um, it being difficult to actually secure property. Let me first share a little bit of um, uh, uh, information about some last quarter numbers for all of them. So the currently for sale properties is about 1700 and the average house price is about 375,000, which is a increase of about 20% versus last year. And the also thing is, is that the things of the properties move quickly. So 15 days from property posting to close is a lot or is very, very, very fast. Um, by the way, I'm seeing some people that are in orientation phase, somebody's already bought, but wants to buy a second property, great. And you're looking forward to buy your first hardware better. That's great news. But if we look at some of these numbers, then you see that price are increasing and properties move very quickly. Why? Because it's such a competitive market at the moment. And hopefully the information that I'll share with you or our support will actually help you secure a property. And if we look at the development of property values, you see that after the global financial crisis, we saw a bit of a dip 2012 to 2014, prices went down or stabilized. And then since 2016, prices have gone up steadily. And of course, the last year is 2021. I expect the price to go up even more the coming coming, was it six or 12 months? Um, why am I sharing this information? Because I think it's very good to understand where you are in the timeline of the market. A lot of people ask me, is this a good time to buy? Um, am I not buying too late or too early? 
then my response is you have to understand the market a little bit to understand where you are in the process and what causes the price to increase is several different things. Fiscal benefits is probably one of the most important things. Tax exemption, if you are 34 years or younger, if you buy a property up to 400,000 euros, you won't be paying transfer tax. Why is that relevant? Because it's gonna save you 2% of the purchase price. What we're seeing, however, is that the people that are saving that money are putting it back into the offer. So that drives prices up a little bit. Also, it's very attractive to buy a home because you can actually deduct the interest that you pay off your mortgage at the end of the year of your income tax. So you'll get about 30% to 40% of the interest that you pay back. That makes it very interesting. There's also no capital gains. So what we're seeing is that people that are selling properties because they move um, can actually take the full profit and put it back into their new home. So again, all these things make it um, so that the prices are increasing. Also, there's low interest rates, right? Money is cheap. It's anywhere between 1.5 to 2% compared to what is it like six, seven years ago was closer to 5% um, and about 20 years ago was closer to like 8%. So what we see is, is that it makes it very attractive for people to actually buy a property and get a loan. Also, the rents are quite high. So um, if you compare renting versus buying, then most of you will consider buying because you actually build up equity and so on. Um, and then there's a lack of supply. The Netherlands is, well, I wouldn't call it famous, but um, we've been very consistent in not making the quotas when it comes to building enough houses. Um, but I don't necessarily believe this is the most important thing. Realtors like to make you believe that it's the most important thing, but that's probably because they also want to have more stock so they can sell more. I believe that the um, discrepancy is because that, okay, supply is not high, of course, but demand is very very high at the moment. Why? Because the government has made it very attractive to buy a home instead of rent a home. So we're seeing more people flock towards the um, buyer's market. And what that means is that if you can't buy a property, then you stick to renting, which means that a lot of people that are currently not able to buy a property because they don't have enough money or they don't earn enough money, they'll actually stay in the rental market, which drives the prices up there as well. And then if the rents go up, then more people will flock towards the buying market and so on. It's kind of like a, uh, I wouldn't call it a vicious circle, but it's kind of like a circle in that sense. Um, then what would you need in savings before you start? We've created a little table. Um, on the left side, you see what the actual uh, type is of cost, then how much it's going to cost you. And the last one is whether it's tax deductible. Tax deductible technically only applies for mortgage related costs. Why? Because the government made it um, so that you would definitely consider getting specialists on board when it's uh, when it comes to mortgages. Mortgages are complex products, so um, the government wants to kind of like motivate you to get support from a mortgage broker or a bank and get a notary in place and so on. So that's why they said, okay, hey, let's make it attractive for people to use these services and let's make the cost that you pay for mortgage-related matters tax deductible. Um, transfer tax is the highest one. You pay 2% of the purchase price. Then you have the mortgage costs, um, um, sorry, the notary costs. You divide them into two notary drafts of mortgage deed, which is tax deductible and a transfer deed, which technically makes you owner. Then you have the typical real estate agent. They charge one to 2% of the bridge price. I don't understand why they still charge percentages. Why would you pay more for an agent if you're already paying more for a property? We don't believe in that. We charge a fixed fee. Um, and then you have the appraiser, a technical inspector, the interpreter, the bank guarantee, and NHG. Maybe a little bit more information about NHG. Um, then she is a mortgage guarantee. What does that mean? Let's say you're forced to sell your property because you lose a limb, you lose a job, you lose a partner. God forbid that happens, but let's say it happens um, and you have to sell your property. If the value of your property is below what you actually got in a mortgage, then the mortgage guarantee will cover that amount. But why is that in place? Because after the global financial crisis, we saw a lot of people having kind of like deficits on their mortgage because they were forced to sell their property. And what they said is, okay, hey, we need to make sure that that doesn't happen. So we installed this thing called a mortgage guarantee. Please know that it's only applicable for properties, I think it's up to 325,000 euros. So uh, make sure that you uh, get a property with the value of that. You, of course, you can pay a little bit more for the property, but if the value is 325, then that is fine. Um, all of these things that are tax deductible are highlighted on the right side of the table. Then, um, hold on, before I go, before I move forward, maybe it's good to know that if you add all these costs up, then um, if you pay transfer tax, take into account that you'll have to save about 5% of the bridge price to move forward, right? If you don't pay transfer tax, it's closer to 3%. It depends a little bit, of course, on how 
expensive your property is because some of these costs are fixed fees. So the more expensive your property, the lower um, the relative, relative percentage will be. Um, so now you know what you have to save or have to have in cash to actually move forward with purchasing your property. Then there's a few tips to win in the current market. And the first one is value, value, value. I, I often get a question like, how much should I overbid? And I still read it in the news as well that um, articles say that you have to overbid 10, 15% over the asking price. And then my first response is like, don't look at the asking price. The asking price is the price that the selling agent uses to put the property up on the market. He's free to do whatever he wants. He can put it up for a lot, for less, for very little. Um, let's look at this property. It's a really nice property. Um, and it's on the market for 395K. So 395K is what the agent defined to be kind of like the selling or the asking price, sorry, the asking price. Um, but the value of the property is 415. The property will be sold for 435. So let's use this narrative, right? The difference between asking and purchase price is 40K. It's about 10%. The difference between market value and purchase price is about 5%. Now, let's use this same property, but apply it to another agent who is a little bit more opportunistic or wants to impress the seller. So what he does, instead of putting up for 395, he puts it up for 375. The value, however, doesn't change. The purchase price will also not change because somebody's going to pay 435 for it. But the difference in asking price and purchase price is 60K, which is 16%. The difference between value and purchase price is not different though. Let's say we all use this narrative, right? And everybody starts saying you have to offer a 15% or 16% over. Apply that to this property, 395 times 60%, and you end up on paying more than 435, which you would otherwise be paying. So what we always say is focus on the market value. How do you define the market value? Um, we can help you with that, but you can also go to something called the land registry or the cadaster, um, and you can look up properties sold in the neighborhood that are similar. Um, so what we always do is we look at properties sold in the last six or 12 months that are similar and in a similar area. Why is that relevant? Because you can't compare a property that is overlooking the water versus a property that is overlooking I don't know, a factory, right? So you have to make sure that it's in kind of like a similar area, similar condition, and you don't compare properties that are 100 square meters versus a property that's 50 square meters. So it also has to be a similar size, type, and quality property. Um, based on that, you can define the market value or a range of the market value. That's what we'll help you with. And then it helps you actually secure the property because you know what you'll be getting as a mortgage because the market value is what the bank will give you as a mortgage. They're not going to look at asking price. They're not going to look at purchase price. They're going to look at market value. Okay. So now you know you have to focus on market value. And now we're going to talk a little bit more about a winning offer. <clears throat> a winning offer is a good price. It's not always the highest price. Let's go to this view, right? Let's say um, you don't have support. You don't know really what the market value is, but you heard that somebody said that you have to bid 16% over. So you go for 450,000 euros. Um, but if you only have what 20K in savings and the market value is for 415, then you end up being able to afford 435. Um, the selling agent will also be aware of this. So if the selling agent gets wind of the fact that you only have 20K in savings, then he's not going to accept your offer, even though it's a better offer. So make sure you offer a good price, a reasonable price, not necessarily always the highest price, right? Look at what you have in savings, what you can spend, and make sure you understand what that market value is, because you'll probably need a mortgage. Then offer security to the seller. So there's several different ways of doing that. The first one is you have to make sure that the seller gets a feeling that you're going to move forward with the process, right? There's several ways of pulling out of the deal if criteria or conditions are not met. One of them is, for example, the um, finance clause. Um, if you don't get a mortgage, then you have the right to pull out. That's the finance clause. If you put that in, though, then the seller has to wait for the six weeks after you've signed that purchase contract before he knows if you're going to move forward or not. Um, if you don't, then he has to start the process all over again. And that's not very attractive, especially if the seller has already bought a new property and wants to move in at some point as well. Um, the other one is the technical inspection. So let's say you add a clause in the contract setting. If the technical inspection comes back, you're not happy with it, you can pull out. These things, of course, give you some sense of security, but they give the seller insecurity. So make sure you balance them out, right? Don't ask for too much. Don't put too many clauses in. By the way, when we talk about that finance clause, <clears throat> I would advise you to talk to a financial specialist, your mortgage broker, before you consider leaving it out, because there is a risk if you don't have it in and you don't get the mortgage. So at least please be mindful of that. Then 
The other one is the least amount of hassle. So the seller will most likely want to move out, but doesn't want to kind of like do all these things to the property. So let's say you ask the seller to repaint the walls, refix the roof and stuff like that. Then he might say, you know what, I'm going to go for an easier offer. Um, critical things like if the boiler's not working then he should definitely fix it but if it's not critical and something you can do yourself don't put it in the um, in the offer the other one is is that let's say the seller wants to um wait a little bit with moving out of the property because he's bought a new home and the home will be finished the first of february then if you ask the seller to move out the first of december he's not going to appreciate that because he'll have to move out store his stuff and then move back into his new home so think about what the seller is also looking for right especially in the current market it's a seller's market so you want to cater a little bit towards their wishes so figure out why is the seller selling when does he want to move out? And is there anything that you should know? <clears throat> then offer personal touch, especially if you buy from somebody who's lived in the property himself. They will want to know who's going to move into their property. And also, especially if you're uh, up against an offer from an investor, they'll most likely go for your offer. But I think it helps if you offer a little bit more information about who you are, where you're on the process, um, why you like the property and uh, why they should sell to you. So these things actually make your offer stronger. So make sure you um, consider this before you submit that offer. Then the last one is due diligence. This is actually a question for you guys, right? So you have the technical inspector. She comes in when... Um, you want to inspect the property and make sure that you know what you're buying, right? So they're going to check if the property's in a good condition, what needs to be renovated or not, and what needs urgent attention. That's the first one. The appraiser comes in to actually appraise the value. So they're going to figure out what the actual market value is. What he does, he comes in, checks the property, but does the majority of his work behind his desk. Once he's filed the report, he's going to send it to an independent institute. They're going to see if he's played by the rules. Once he has, and it's been kind of like approved, then it goes to the bank. My question to you guys is, when do you book them? Do you book them before your offer is accepted or after the offer is accepted? Okay, I'm going to spill the beans on this one. So you book them in after your offer is accepted. Why? Well, first of all, these guys cost money. And if you get them in before your offer is accepted, then uh, your offer is not accepted, then you've lost that money, right? I understand that you all want to know the market value and the condition of the property before you actually commit. But when you submit an offer and it's accepted, you're not committed to the deal yet. You're only committed to the deal once the cool-off period ends. The cool-off period is actually linked to you signing the purchase contract. The purchase contract is an agreement between you and the seller that you're going to buy. The seller is going to sell under certain conditions. Three days after the bridge contract signing, your cool off period expires. Within those three days, you can still pull out of the deal. What you want to do is once your offer is accepted, you want to actually book these guys in ASAP, right? Because you want to get those reports in, preferably even before the bridge contract signing, because the bridge contract signing um, is kind of like an official moment, right? It's not committing you yet, but it's kind of like an official moment. So if you want to do any negotiation, do it before you sign the bridge contract. Afterwards, it's going to be a little bit trickier. So make sure you book them in ASAP after your offer is accepted, and hopefully you'll be able to get the reports before the bridge contract signing. If not, then make sure you get the reports no later than the cool off period, right? So make sure you book these guys in and don't wait too long for it okay now i'm going to talk a little bit about the timeline which is also the final part of this presentation so um from start search to getting the offer accepted and by the way this is a bit of a skewed period because it can take weeks months depending on what's out there um what you like whether your offer is accepted or not but let's say your offer is accepted in a relatively quick or short period Congratulations, then you get the appraiser and technical inspector in, then you sign a purchase contract. And by the way, this period from offer acceptance to signing the purchase contract often is a week and a half or two weeks even sometimes. Then the mortgage application is finalized, right? So they can finally send all of the documentation to the bank or to the mortgage provider. Don't wait though, talking to a mortgage advisor or a bank. Why? Because most of the work is done prior to the mortgage application. So make sure you talk to them already. By the way, if you want us to connect you to a uh, good mortgage advisor or a bank, then let us know. Well, most likely we'll be able to connect you to a mortgage advisor because there's not that many banks out. But let me know, maybe pop your name and email in the chat and we'll actually connect you to a independent mortgage advisor. Why do I recommend talking to both of them? I always consider the banks to be kind of like old fashioned retail. They have like what? three products that they'll try to sell you. So when you go into the bank, they'll try to sell you those products and don't really care about anything else, right? A mortgage advisor is kind of like your independent what, stylist, 
shopper, they'll be able to tell you much more about all the different packages that are out there because they have about 40 different packages from all these different providers. So they'll be able to tell you what you should take into account, what the best rates are and all that stuff. Um, and they're not linked to any provider because they don't get an incentive from any provider to actually sell their products. It's not uh, allowed, it's against the law. So get a conversation with both of them, figure out what feels better, but a mortgage advisor will be able to kind of like support you and they'll make sure that you understand the product, you're happy with it and it looks good on you as well. So talk to both of them because in the end, it's also a bit of a gut feel thing. Um, then the mortgage application starts, the cool off period ends about three days after the purchase contract signing. And then the period of getting your mortgage approved starts is about four weeks. Uh, sometimes it happens much faster, sometimes a little bit slower. It depends a little bit on your specific case. Um, by the way, I get a question from Damien. How much does an appraiser cost? An appraiser costs about 600 to maybe 650 euros. And for the technical inspector, it's about 430 to 450 euros. The cost of a mortgage advisor, it depends a little bit. Like we have seen mortgage advisors charge 2,500 euros, but also mortgage advisors are charged like 3,200 euros. So um, do your research or let us know, just pop your name and email in the chat and we'll connect you to one or two independent mortgage advisors that we trust and that can actually support internationals. Hope that answers your question, Damien, and also for you, ASUS. Um, okay, so where were we? So your mortgage application is approved, congratulations. You now got the loan from the bank. And then about seven days before you get the keys to the property, the notary will send kind of like a final invoice. What does that invoice consist of? So you have the purchase price, and then on top of it, you have those purchase fees that we talked about. And then what they'll do is they'll deduct the money that the bank has given off that amount. So the mortgage will be deducted off that amount. And then a small amount will remain, three to 5% of the purchase price. And that is something you have to transfer to the notary before you actually get the keys. And then on the day that you become owner, there's three things that you do. First, you go to the property to inspect if it's still in a good condition. If not, then you can have the notary keep some money behind of the money that you're spending on the property to make sure that the seller or the seller will fix it. Um, if the property is in a good condition, you go to notary and then you'll sign the transfer deed, which makes you the owner, and you'll sign a mortgage deed, which makes you a proud owner of a mortgage. Then you'll get the keys and then you'll become the proud owner of a property. Then. You move in. Maybe you wait a day or wait a couple of couple of days, or maybe you wait a week because maybe you have to paint, you want to do some renovation, stuff like that. Moving is always a bit time consuming. Um, and then you find out that something isn't working. Well, you have a reasonable time to inform the seller that it wasn't working. And most important thing is that you can prove that it wasn't working when you moved in or before you moved in. So um, that's key. So the reasonable time we consider to be two months, but don't wait too long because if you inform the seller about something two months afterwards, then the seller most likely will say, nope, it was working when I uh, gave you the keys. And how do you prove that it wasn't, right? So we had a case where a power socket wasn't working for a client of ours. And then two days later, we find out, um, we informed the seller and we said, you should have known about this. A power socket not working is not necessarily a big thing, but the electrician came by and he said, you have to rewire part of the circuit. It's going to cost you about 1500 euros. So um, that was too expensive, especially uh, a first few days in. So we held the seller liable and they paid for the bill. But if we would have waited two months claiming that didn't work, then the seller would have probably said, no, it, it was working when I was there. Probably just broke bad luck. It's up to you. So don't wait for too long to actually flag these things. Um, this timeline can take up anywhere between three to six to nine months, depending on how fast you find something. And of course, how fast you get your offer accepted. And then the last criteria is how fast does the seller want to move out? Because if the seller's bought something new and he requires some time to kind of like renovate the place, then he might say, okay, I want to move out the 1st of February, the 1st of January, the 1st of March. It depends a little bit. So take into account that you'll need some time to complete this process. Um, anyone that wants to move in the end of this year, the beginning of next year, please feel free to already start the process and search because um, nowadays it's, uh, it's relatively competitive and before you actually find a property that you love, get everything completed, then most likely you'll be looking at the end of this year, beginning of next year. Um, that's in short a presentation. Um, if there are any questions, please feel free to ask now. I'm happy to answer any of them. So a question from Roberto, does the 30% tax ruling give me any benefits on 
taxes after buying a house. So the 30% ruling is linked to your income tax. It's not linked to any taxes that you pay for the property. So um, that is good to know. So it's not going to have any benefits on taxes that you pay once you own the property. Does the overbidding have a impact on the limited amount for NHG? So NHG is linked to the value of the property. So if you offer a 340 for the property, but the value is 325, then you will be able to get the NHG. Um, the overdraft blasting the transfer tax is well up to 400k. Um, so yeah, most likely if you get NHG and you pay 400k for a property or anywhere below 400k or close to 400k, um, the NHG is not doesn't have any impact on transfer tax. But again, um, if you pay more than 400k for transfer tax for a property, then you won't be able to get transfer tax, even if you pay some of it in cash. So there's two different things, NHG, value related. So the value of the property can't be more than 325. And then the transfer tax, you can't buy a property for more than 400,000 euros. And of course you have to be 34 years or younger. And if you've already bought a property this year using the exemption, you can't use it again. So a question from Damie, um, you wanna buy a second home with financing. My first home has gone up in value. That's great news, of course, first of all. Um, what I would do is I would um, talk to a mortgage advisor um, because what you want to do is you want to most likely remortgage your house um, and take some of that value and put it into a new property. Um, there's two things that you need to take into account. Um, interest rates, of course, I'm not sure what your initial interest rate is or, or what your current interest rate is, but it might have gone up a little bit since you last bought, or you might even be able to get it, make it go down. Um, there's also something that if you remortgage with a different mortgage advisor, then you might have to pay a fine for kind of like uh, getting out of the other mortgage initially. So have a chat with your mortgage advisor that has helped you get that first mortgage in the first place. The second thing that you want to take into account is if you buy a second home, it's going to be a, well, it depends a little bit. If you can buy completely with the money that you uh, have out of your first home, then it doesn't necessarily equal a investment property. But if you do get a second mortgage out for that second home, then it's going to be an investment property because if you're not going to live in it, then the bank considers it to be an investment property. And criteria differ a little bit there because you have to put up cash yourself because banks consider properties as investments to be of lower value than properties as residents. Why? Two reasons. Well, first of all, there's a tenant in the property that you're probably going to rent out and it's more difficult to sell properties with tenants. The second thing is, is that if you're not living it yourself, then Experience has proven that um, landlords who are not living in the property themselves maintain the property in a different way than tenants are. So uh, then, uh, then owners who live in the property are do. So um, the value of the property might go down because of that. So take into account that you probably have to bring in 25 to 30 percent as a deposit yourself, and interest rates will actually be higher for investment properties. Um, are there any tips I can give you? Um, my first tip would be talk to a mortgage advisor and then also have a look at how you want to structure the financing of your next property. Also, what kind of property are you looking for? Where are you looking for it? Um, just do some research, but first figure out how much you can actually spend. Another question from Roberto. Do you only work on Rotterdam? I joined the webinar because I'm considering buying, but I'm actually interested in other areas surrounding The Hague. Yes, so we work in several cities. We work in Amsterdam, Rotterdam, The Hague, Eindhoven. Um, we've launched Groningen recently. So yes, we uh, do cover a great, uh, great area. Leiden technically also. So don't hesitate to reach out to us, Roberto. Um, Ankita, from what point of time can Ian Chen help me buying a house? I'm still in the orientation phase. So I would advise you to talk to a mortgage advisor first. Um, and then if you, as soon as you know when you, what you can spend, like come to us, you can already come to us, of course, like book in a meeting with us. And then we're happy to walk you through the process, share with you what we can do for you and so on. Uh, so we can already help you out. We have two different packages. One is a package where we kind of like digitally support you. It's a little more affordable. Um, we don't actually join on viewings, but we, um, do all the research submit the offer negotiation, review the legal documents, um, define the market value and stuff like that. Um, and we can actually kick in, you know, kick into gear, come into play once you've found a property that you want to submit an offer on. We also have a complete package where we actually do join you on viewings and then we schedule viewings and stuff like that. Um, it's a little bit more expensive, but um, have a look at our website on Kita, but we're happy to help you out. Then question from Damy. So if the value went up 50,000 euros, do I still have to deposit an amount? <clears throat> um, so the question is, I think that if you buy a new property, 
and it's going to be an investment property, you'd probably still need a mortgage, right? Then you'll most likely get an investment mortgage. Then for that new property, you have to deposit about 25 to 30% yourself. If the value of your current property is going up by 50K, you can maybe take out some of that money, if not all of that money, to invest towards that new property. Asus, do we also operate outside the country? Not yet. Not yet, not yet. And I think that's going to take a while, right? We first want to cover more ground in the Netherlands, support people with buying a home in the Netherlands, and then maybe at some point we'll actually support outside of the country. But please note, rules, laws, and regulations are different in those countries, so it will require us to get local talent on to support us. Um, where can you look best for properties to purchase? Question from or from Asus. Fonda is the best link, the best the best possible way to actually look for properties. Um, then another question from Roberto, is December a good time to buy a house or will it probably be a problem due to no train inspector availability? No, I think that winter are much better times to buy a property. The only difficulty is that you won't really know what the light will do with the property and so on. But I do think that summer people feel energized. They feel like they can take on the world. And it's also quite nice to see properties right in summer. Um, so you don't have to really plow through the snow or um, uh, bike through the rain. So I definitely consider winter to be a good time to buy a property. I must say that the stock will be a little bit lower as well because the majority of people will actually put their property on in spring and in uh, late summer. But I think that especially consider, um, uh, consider winter to actually look for properties. Another question, what about Makla's Land as a website to check properties? I think Makla's Land also just posts their properties on Funda. So it's not like Makla's Land puts their properties up on Makla's Land and then not post them on Funda. Funda has about what, 95 to 96% of all the properties on the market for sale. Um, the majority of properties are not on Funda are either too expensive because people don't really want to expose them to the outside world or um, are sold uh, uh, between friends, family, and so on. So um, I would definitely check Funda if I were you. Um, auction properties, as as uh, us, um, if we have experience with that, we don't have a lot of experience with auction properties. Why? Because auction properties are properties that you can't view. So auction properties are properties that are properties that have been foreclosed on because the uh, owner couldn't kind of like commit to their mortgage anymore. And what the banks do is they hey, hold these auctions and they just say, okay, hey, just the paperwork, just the information, buy it or don't buy it. It's it's for a little bit of a better price, but um, I think that the risk of not being able to see the property and understand what you're buying, especially if you want to live in it yourself, is too big. So for me, the um, enjoyable part of this of this process is helping people find a home that they're going to move into and going to enjoy living in. And part of that is also gut feeling, right? When they've seen the property, it has to click and has to feel right. With an auction property, it's um, it's tricky. So I wouldn't necessarily advise that unless you want to go for a really investment property and so on. But um, um, we don't have any experience with, uh, with that. I think we've done it. No, I can't really recall if we've done it. Any further questions? There's always, a, I think, a bit of a lag between the questions. and, uh, um, But I, I consider this to be the final, no? Um, if you have any questions, of course, moving forward, you know where to find us. I popped the link in the chat. Let me do it again. Please feel free to book in a, uh, an intake with us if you um, uh, um, have any further questions on the line or the next couple of weeks, months. Again, book in an intake or just send us a quick email. Um, I want to thank you. Have a lovely day and it's almost weekend, another day and a half, and then you'll be able to enjoy Saturday and Sunday. So thanks a lot. Have a great day and hope to see you soon. Take care, guys.